well as cities and other utilities outside of the city of Atlanta. We have a workforce of just over 1,500 uh, team members, and we have an average, an overall vacancy rate right now of about 12 percent, 15, 12, 12 percent. And I should have started by introducing my colleagues that are with me, our uh, CAO who has led our workforce development efforts and my director of policy and intergovernmental affairs, just a little bit of personal privilege. Um, so we have a, a team of over 1,500, um, a vacancy rate that's at 12%. We've been trying to get down to single digits, uh, which has been a significant challenge, and I'll, I'll say why. But as a utility, the city of Atlanta's Department of Watershed Management has what are among the highest rates in the country, largely due to unfunded federal mandates, which adds to the affordability challenges that we see in our city, specifically communities in the south and west parts of the city of Atlanta. And it's estimated that 30% of households fall below an income of 25,000 a year. We have 23.2% of our households that are below the median household income. And we estimate that 50% of households in the city of Atlanta have affordability challenges. So as an anchor institution, the utility has an opportunity to provide skills training and jobs for communities that are underserved and in a way that addresses other challenges in the city like uh, youth offenders, repeat youth offenders, the need to reduce recidivism, and capturing this probably close to 75% of graduating high schoolers that likely will not attend college in meaningful career tracks to, to assist the families and, uh, that are in those communities with affordability challenges. And then we're also supporting the mayor's platform on affordability and equity by being intentional about gender and racial diversity and developing a workforce development framework that reaches the communities that most need employment and stable career tracks. I run water and wastewater utilities in Baltimore and Jackson, Mississippi, as you've heard, and now Atlanta. And I've found that these are needs and opportunities that have existed in each of these utility service areas. But there are significant challenges in retaining institutional knowledge. We are faced with uh, high retirement eligibility in the city of Atlanta. About 48% of our workforce is eligible to retire over the next 10 years. And it's very difficult for us to attract talented, knowledgeable, trained replacement workers. Um, these opportunities, as Joe will talk about, are really not known to most people. Um, folks don't talk about, as you said, growing up to, to work for a water utility. Some folks don't know what that means. Certainly when it comes to the other side of water, the clean water side, which is actually the wastewater side, um, folks are just not attracted and what has become particularly difficult for us is to attract and, and retain the attention of our millennials, which we have uh, put a lot of work into. And in fact, the CEO is headed to Denver tomorrow uh, for a conference on millennial workforce development. Um, so that's, um, you know, kind of a little bit about the utility in the city of Atlanta and some of the challenges, and I'll delve deeper into what we're doing as we, as we go on. Great. Um, Tony, if you can talk about your work in Louisville, and I know there's, uh, in regards to consent decrees and construction projects that need uh, to hire and retain workers, maybe you can talk a little bit about how that's impacting what's happening in Louisville. Sure. You know, for the last uh, 13 years, I've had the uh, honor of working uh, in Cincinnati and in Louisville and in both cities responsible for the implementation of major capital programs. Uh, the capital programs, respectively, when you look at what we have to do to meet federal consent decree requirements and our normal asset management requirements, which is taking care of the system, uh, about a $4 billion effort in both cities over the next 20 years. And so to be in that role and in that responsibility, obviously, you get to see things from a different perspective, uh, particularly when a lot of the improvements that we're making in our cities are in the urban core uh, parts of our communities. 
uh, which is predominantly African American. And so we're disrupting African American communities. We're doing work in African American communities. But yet, when we look at contractor utilization, we're not utilizing folks from the African American community. So, from that perspective, you know, as a leader of utility in Cincinnati and leader of utility in Louisville, I had the opportunity to start having conversations with other cities, uh, particularly the city of Atlanta, the city of San Francisco, the uh, city of Philadelphia, the city of Cleveland, a lot of cities. And we actually had a convening four years ago here in D.C. to talk about what, from a general manager perspective, we wanted to get out to the nation in terms of our message. Uh, so we had a convening and it was really focused on in partnership with uh, the U.S. Water Alliance, how do we get the message out about the value that we bring to our communities and the economic boom that we bring to our communities as it relates to job creation and as it relates to the utilization of contractors. So just to kind of give you a little bit of perspective uh, from Louisville, uh, we serve uh, Louisville and Jefferson County, and uh, our consent decree and our critical repair plan is a $4.2 billion program over the next 20 years. Uh, we have uh, an organization that has workforce, aging workforce. We have about 800 employees. Uh, approximately 30% of them are uh, either eligible to retire in the next five years. 12% uh, of them are eligible to retire this year. So from an organizational perspective, uh, we're trying to get the word out to the community about how we can uh, recruit, uh, whether it be from the college level or whether it be from uh, the community, folks who would be interested in working for a public utility. Uh, as far as the capital side, uh, we do have a local hire policy for every project that we put out to the street that is over $5 million, uh, the contractor has to commit to the utilization of a certain percentage of uh, workers from uh, Louisville and Jefferson County. Um, so with that, uh, we make, we're making a lot of progress, but when we reach out, uh, we're finding that you know our contractors, their number one excuse is, well, we can't find uh, eligible uh, employees. So, uh, two things that we're, we've been working on. One is, uh, we just completed a disparity study uh, to look at not only contractor utilization, but also uh, how we are using uh, minority-owned and uh, women-owned companies within our community, uh, and how do we grow those businesses. Uh, our disparity study came back, uh, just kind of give you a little framework, it was a five-year period that we looked at, contractor utilization, and it showed that we had disparity when it comes to the utilization of African-American-owned companies and uh, female companies. So with that, we now have, with the disparity study, now we have the opportunity to go forward from a legal perspective in case we're challenged to have mandatory goals for uh, companies that are doing work for uh, utility. Uh, the second thing we're doing, and I'll talk a little bit later about this, is connecting with the community as it relates to the utilization of uh, workers from the communities that uh, are being impacted by our capital program. Uh, we put forth a job portal, it's called JobLink, and what that does is uh, the contractors can now go to our JobLink, they can post the specific jobs that they are looking for, uh, the community can have access to that job link, and so we're actually building a bridge in the portal so that the contractor can reach the community and the community can be aware of the different types of skill craft areas that our contractors are doing work or needing work for. Tell me, so, what is the, is it the job portal created? Is there a link that? Yes, uh, the job portal is created, and I was remiss. I do want to introduce my director of community benefits, Cherise Horn. Uh, who has actually uh, rolled that out and got that uh, rolling. We rolled that out earlier this year, and uh, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think we probably have over 50 contractors that are now uh, logged into our job link, and there's multiple 
jobs that are now available for the community to kind of uh, link up with, with our contractors. So no longer is there a, an excuse from a contractor perspective to say we can't find good folks. Um, and you know, one of the things that we struggle with in Louisville is affordability. Uh, there's a lot of political resistance to raise rates to give us what we need to do to continue our capital efforts. We have aging infrastructure. Um, and so one of the things we try to show is, is that there's a way to bring value or give back to the community through our construction programs. Um, the uh, affordability, uh, about 40% of our households are probably below the median household income. And the majority of those are in our African-American community. So we have to be cognizant of that as we roll out these great initiatives. But in order to balance it, we got to be able to show that we're willing to not only put folks to work, but also give opportunities for economic inclusion, whether it be for construction or for professional services for minority-owned businesses and women-owned businesses. So that's the perspective from Louisville's perspective. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask you to a, a quick follow-up because you mentioned contractors spending over five million. You said that you have a clause that allows that that requires them to hire locally. Is that is that being is that is that the, is that correct? I'm sorry. This is over five million dollar uh, contractors who spend clause that requires them to hire locally a certain percentage. Is that replicated in other areas, or is this is this sort of Louisville's taking the lead on this, or are you collaborating with other? Actually, uh, what we did this year, our original policy in Louisville was for every contract above 10 million. Uh, so we actually lobbied our board to reduce that for every contract above 5 million. So we are successful in doing that. Uh, when I was in Cincinnati and we tried to implement uh, local labor uh, utilization policy there, and contractors challenged it, and the courts overruled it. And so, not really sure if uh, they actually fully implemented it there, but uh, there was a legal challenge in Ohio that prevented uh, the, the implementation of that policy in Cincinnati. In Cincinnati. Okay. All, right. All right, I'll come back to you there uh, with, with questions uh, on this end that I'm interested in. I know that, for instance, the sort of inform, it's interesting this question you said about folks saying that, that our communities are invisible and not around and they, you know, we can't hide them because they don't exist. That's the, that's the same argument given in the tech space as well. And you find that literally and figuratively in the backyards of these places are communities that are that can get there in, in sort of real time. So how, how does that infer, how do you close that information gap? And uh, I think the portal is fantastic and they're doing this in the energy space with API as well. So uh, I think all of these are happening at the at the same time in terms of just kind of taking ownership and getting the model right for uh, reaching out to the community. So I, I want to turn uh, to to Joseph Kane um, on, on this report that he has. I know in San Francisco, Atlanta, and Louisville, and other utilities, the Water Agency Leaders Alliance helped commission this report. So if you could talk a little bit about your findings, and I know you have some slides to show, so I'll get out of your way and you can talk to us about the work Brookings is doing in this capacity. Great. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here today. And let me just first off say I really appreciate sharing the stage with Keisha, Tony, and Katie. Um, unfortunately, the San Francisco team couldn't be here, but really do admire a lot of the great work that they were previewing. And, and definitely recommend you check that out online, too, beyond whatever you hear today. Um, so really, to build off what the others are already saying, um, I want to emphasize that the water sector is emblematic of an enormous economic opportunity uh, that infrastructure offers the whole country. And I'll say this opportunity is not simply about creating a certain amount of jobs by investing in the project, uh, but it's about hiring, training, and retaining uh, a skilled workforce to construct, operate, and maintain our infrastructure uh, for decades to come. And, and ideally, um, as we're talking about today, these efforts um, are going to be connected to the diverse communities served by utilities and other foundational infrastructure actors, uh, leading to broadly shared uh, economic gains. And, and that serves as a basis for the report um, that Hannah has mentioned um, that came out last June. Uh, that I'll briefly preview today. And, and if you have a chance, though, again, I, I encourage you to check it out on, on the Brookings website. Um, and I also do want to emphasize, in addition to all the 
the data that you see me presenting here, a big part of the report was very qualitative uh, and looking at a lot of case studies and best practices and challenges that, that we heard from folks like Keisha, Tony, and others across the country. And so really want to give them a lot of credit um, for giving us the chance as researchers to hear and see what they're doing um, when it comes to actually pressing some of the bounds on, on some of these issues. So before getting into findings, I just want to first start with what we even mean by water workers. <laughs> so I don't think it's necessarily intuitive. Um, uh, as you can see here, we define water workers as, as essentially factory mothers workers who are directly involved in constructing, operating, designing, and governing uh, our country's various uh, water infrastructure systems. So again, it's not just sort of short-term shovel-ready jobs, it's actually careers um, over many decades. Uh, and so when I say water infrastructure, um, I'm referring not only to, to sort of drinking water, but also wastewater, stormwater, green infrastructure facilities throughout the country, which, which you'll see in a second are crucially not just limited to utilities. Utilities are a hugely important, uh, as we've heard before, a lot of anchor sort of employers and institutions and markets, but the opportunities do not end there. Um, so when we think of a sort of the water workforce, we're thinking of all the different industries and establishments, engineering and design firms, construction companies, material suppliers, and so on, which really underscores, I think, the need to consider a broad suite uh, of jobs in, in utilities and more beyond, and, and you'll see that a lot of these workers embody many of the skilled trades, so it's not just sort of water infrastructure, but the skilled trades in particular. And then also many are involved in a variety of administrative, technical, and management positions. So, so really the pie that we're talking about here, I think, is, is a lot bigger than what a lot of uh, folks may actually envision up to this point. So as we turn to the actual findings from the report, um, there are four total that I'm going to point to uh, today. Um, the first is just how many <laughs> water workers there are across the country. Um, and we found that there are 1.7 million uh, workers across 212 different occupations, again, who are directly involved in designing, constructing, operating, governing uh, U.S. water infrastructure. Um, I'll just first off emphasize, you know, water utilities represent one of the biggest employers in the water sector, but, but multiple other industries uh, are crucial to consider as well. And you can see here, water utilities employ 298,000 workers by themselves, which is huge, but but that's only about 17.7% of this whole sector. Um, so in other words, utilities are part of a complex uh, economic sector filled by a variety of different firms and, and really establishments looking for skilled talent right now. Um, so I, I do want to emphasize too, and this is embedded really in the report, is the foundational role played by utilities. And so since utilities control some of the most crucial public assets in need of long-term operation and maintenance, um, as Keisha and Tony were describing a few minutes ago, and actually, they tend to be located in some of the most disadvantaged communities nationally. Uh, they represent many uh, major anchor institutions in many ways. And so I do encourage you to check out the report where we have done some additional analysis on that role, too. Continuing this first finding, um, collectively, the water workforce fills, again, 212 different occupations. Um, and so you imagine a lot of these, these workers are carrying a variety of activities, um, from installing and repairing equipment, uh, to analyzing and overseeing operations. It's just a few, few examples here of the 212 occupations. You can see plumbers are, are among the largest, employing about 324,000 workers just by themselves, or about 20% of the water workforce. Uh, operating engineers, employing nearly 80,000 workers nationally. And then again, uh, in addition to skilled trades, um, there are also many positions in, in administration, finance, and management, as you can see here, over 47,000 uh, office clerks as well. Um, but what I want to stress, too, is that water workers are not isolated to only a few areas across the country. Um, so they're employed everywhere. Uh, so again, I think speaks to the enormous geographic reach and, and really the, the stretch of this opportunity we're seeing across the country. So they consistently represent about 1 to 2% of total employment in each of these markets, which might seem like a, a pretty small total, but, but actually, <laughs> I mean, that's just a lot of workers everywhere. They're not geographically isolated. And so you can see they're anywhere from, from larger markets like New York and Los Angeles, but then also uh, markets like New Orleans, Baton Rouge, uh, and elsewhere. So really, there, there is no geographic exclusivity to, to these positions. So the second finding, um, which I think is probably one of the most important in the report that we found, again, underscoring really the, the, the opportunity through, through these positions, is that they tend to not only pay more on average compared to all jobs nationally, but they also tend to offer more equitable wages. By that, I mean they pay up to 50% more to workers um, at lower ends of the income scale. And so as you can see on this slide, you know, on average, work, water workers earn higher wages uh, at that sort of middle, the median. Um, these not only include higher paying occupations overall, or lawyers, hydrologists, and general operations managers, but, but also if you pay attention to that 10th 
and 25th percentile, um, sort of the bottom end of the income distribution, you can see that actually they're paying $5 to $6 more per hour um, to those workers. So a lot of those workers are entry level workers looking to transition into this sector. So the fact that even those workers are realizing some of the wage potential here, I think, is, is hugely important and, and just sort of put a, a cap on, on what this means. So 180 of the 212 water occupations or more than one and a half million workers are earning higher wages at both those percentiles, right? So really there are a lot of communities and individual workers who are benefiting um, from these positions across the country. Now with that said, you'd be like, well, okay, that's great, they make a lot of money <laughs> starting out, but then they have to have more education, right? But actually we find just the opposite, that um, many of these water workers tend to require less formal education um, while earning these competitive wages. And so in fact, 53% uh, only have a high school diploma or less. Um, so you can see here, to put another way, 32.5% of workers across all occupations nationally fall into this category. Um, but you can see that, that water workers tend to actually have lower uh, formal educational barriers to entry. Uh, and these include, again, any positions from carpenters to welders to septic tank servicers uh, and so on. But I do want to stress, too, as much as um, you know, there are also many highly educated workers here as well, so only about 15% of the water workforce holds a bachelor's degree or higher, but, but again, we can't overlook, I think, landscape architects, environmental engineers, computer system managers, and so on, who are crucial to, to utility operations and other, other employers nationally. And what I want to stress, too, is beyond education, what's often um, really emphasizing these positions is related work experience and on-the-job training. So even though many of these water workers do not need a lot of advanced education to qualify for positions, many of them do need related experience. So we found that 78% of water workers need at least one year of related work experience. And, and we know in, in some of the biggest occupations, including water treatment operators, uh, they actually need two to four years of related experience, which, which makes sense because of the skilled nature of their work, but also can represent a barrier to entry when we think of many prospective workers who lack that experience. And just another stat to sort of highlight this is that uh, on top of work experience, 45% need uh, at least one year of on-the-job training. So we're talking about applied learning opportunities being hugely significant for these workers. It's not so much the degree you hold, but actually the experience and training that you have. And, and that, to me, and we'll talk about this later, I'm sure, puts a lot of onus on employers and policymakers to make sure that there are the pathways for, for all types of workers to secure opportunities in this sector. And so finally, the, the fourth finding um, highlights you know, who are the water workers even right now. Um, and what we're finding is, is as Keisha and Tony were already alluding to, that many tend to be older, uh, but also they tend to lack diversity in many key occupations. I'll just run through three top level figures here in this respect. So in terms of age, um, we know that uh, uh, in terms of occupations, including water treatment operators, they tend to be older. So you see 46 years old or 42 years old for all occupations nationally. But what I want to stress is that there's also a lower share of younger workers um, filling these positions. So it's not just about a silver tie, right? But actually there's, there's an empty pipeline sort of beginning to, which is really putting a crunch on the operations of, of utilities under employers in the sector. The other point that, that I want to bring up too, and I'm sure Katie will talk to as well, is that um, there is also a lack of, of women in many of these positions too. And to me, this is just a startling statistic when you think about it, that if you line up 100 people in a room, that only 15 of 100 in the water sector are actually women. Uh, and then versus the whole country, we see 47, right? And so it's entirely surprising, right, when you think of the skilled trades, sort of the, the physical requirements of some of these positions, but, but still, I, I think, you know, just from the research standpoint, it was just so startling to see this, this underrepresentation among women in many of these positions. And then finally, um, I do want to point to the, the lack of racial diversity we're seeing um, in many of these positions, too. Um, and so while Nearly two thirds of the water workforce is white, uh, similar to the ratio found across all occupations nationally. You can see here that black um, and Asian workers only make up about 12% of the water workforce compared to 18% of those employed in all jobs nationally. And, and what's interesting is you can see that the Hispanic share of the water workforce, about 22%, actually exceeds the national average um, across all occupations. But, but this is primarily due to their concentration in, in many construction jobs. And so people of color and in particular, tend to be underrepresented in higher level, higher paying occupations involved in engineering and management. So this raises a lot of important points, right? Not just simply hiring workers to get them into these entry level opportunities, but making sure that they're progressing through their careers and able to take on additional responsibilities and, and management as well. So with that, I know that's a lot of 
information, but I look forward to, to raising more issues as we get to you. Thank you. Um, thank you. That, that, these are fascinating results. So I, I, before turning to Kate, I, I do want to ask, uh, it, because it appears that this market is ripe for hiring. I mean, the barriers to entry are distinctly different <laughs> than other sectors. There's, there's not, you're not necessarily discriminated on, uh, on the basis of educational attainment. So this piece about the um, responsibility of employers, uh, how, how do you see us getting to a place where we can make this connection? You know, because we're not, it's not an issue, uh, it's atypical issues that are challenging the diversity uh, in the water workforce. So what have you found in this experience in that regard? Yeah, uh, totally. So, I mean, the whole second half of the report, which I need to get to, yeah. <laughs> actually gets to something that's a strategy of not just thinking and planning around this, but actually acting. And again, we have much credit to, to the law group in particular, I think, raising some of the, the issues and awareness of even the opportunity. There's a lot of this is visibility awareness, I mean, just sort of first off. But there's an awareness that it's not just limited to, the, to even the water sector, right? But it's really the infrastructure sector, skilled trades that, you know, it's just water people talking to water people. <laughs> that's helpful in, in the sense of peer-to-peer -peer learning, but we have even on development officials, we have workforce practitioners, you need to be able to all hands on deck, right, kind of approach to this. And so, um, which I'm happy to kind of talk about some of the, I'm sure other speakers will talk about this, right, but it needs to be starting very much driven by employers. Uh, it also needs to be uh, raised as a community issue, but it needs to be community buy-in um, to this, right, at a regional level. And then, of course, sort of, we're in Washington, right, so sort of the federal, sort of national angle on this, too, of how can, how can those players provide the extra capacity, right, um, to some of those local Exactly, and we all have a role to play, so it's, it's not just the employers uh, for, for sure, and I'm reminded of uh, being so surprised to hear that, for instance, the SFPUC, the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, has an internship program for 1,500 interns, I believe it is, a year. I mean, it's an overwhelming number, um, and so the pipeline just starts by literally just beginning to, to, to reach out to the community and let them know, and, and, and 1,500 will show up as many times as you ask them to. So uh, with regard to the skills piece, you know, Katie, you're with the National Skills Coalition, so how do you see, um, in terms of sort of best opportunities at the federal level to advance equity and workforce development in this sector, um, what are you seeing uh, as what strategies that work, what are you seeing as uh, challenges that persist? Uh, so I will I will try to build a little bit on, on what everyone said. Um, so National Skills Coalition, DC's advocacy organization, uh, as the name suggests, we're a coalition of workforce stakeholders. So we work with uh, we work with businesses. We work with a lot of small and medium sized businesses because they're often the folks who rely on and use the workforce development system a lot. Um, we work with workforce development folks, so the folks that are running workforce boards and, and working in a one stop in the communities. We work with community and technical college leaders, um, both on the credit side and the non-credit side. Um, we work with community-based organizations, labor and labor, labor management partnerships who are often conveners and, and helping uh, do a lot of outreach to populations who may not look like the current workforce in across industries. Um, uh, I'm trying to forget some superficial uh, stakeholder at this point, but we work, we work with a lot of people who are kind of self-selected and interested in what workforce looks like in their industry. Um, and that varies. That varies across industries, it varies across states, it varies across whether you're talking about an urban or a rural environment, but there are also a ton of commonalities. Um, and the water workforce, like the workforce in general in the U.S. right now, um, is largely middle skill jobs, which is what the National Skills Coalition focuses on. So we focus on jobs that require more than a high school diploma and less than a four-year degree. So a lot of what I was just talking about, looking at how can other post-secondary education options, whether we're talking about an associate's degree at a community technical college, an industry-recognized certificate that may be awarded uh, through a training program that's done in a community organization, uh, apprenticeship and work-based learning opportunities. There's lots of different kinds of training that people get that um, provide these kind of industry-recognized credentials. They get them along that pathway um, from where their formal schooling left off, um, that isn't a path through it, what uh, many folks think of as just going to a four-year degree. Um, and so those are kind of the, the workforce where we see the biggest gap right now. So there, um, uh, nationally there's about a 10% gap, which is larger than we see in higher middle-skilled jobs, between the number of workers trained for these middle-skilled jobs 
uh, and the, the number of openings. So this is really where employers are feeling this push most, most universally across the country is how are we getting people trained for these jobs? Um, and the, the water workforce is similar. Um, I think you have already heard and we'll continue to hear as we keep talking a lot of uh, uh, focus on what San Francisco has been able to do. Um, and they commissioned a study that looked at what are the jobs that folks are looking for that you know, supported uh, a lot of what, of what Joe just described. But really looking at how are these skilled trade jobs, how are jobs like electricians and machinists um, and technicians to work some of those machines, how are we training people and getting the workforce prepared for that, for that job? Um, uh, and so that's, that's kind of where the, the workforce is generally. And there's a lot of kind of best practices we see happening at a national level. So um, I will focus on some of the broadly and then can uh, dive into some of the policy pieces as that makes more sense. Um, but one of the things that we focus on are, uh, are how are partnerships at the local level coming together. So Lokesha and Tony talked about the work that they're doing. I mean, I think it's absolutely incredible that you all are leading on the job portal work, that that's something that um, as an employer you were creating and taking the onus on because for a lot of uh, businesses and industry partners, either for small employers that's not something they have the capacity to create, or if they're only posting a few jobs a year, it would be worth people using. Um, and that's where it, working together with the workforce development system, with community colleges, and creating these partnerships at the local level to make sure that everyone is talking a similar language, sharing resources, figuring out what is the amount of schooling that needs to happen at a community college, and where can business come in and do that on the job training. Um, Creating those kind of partnerships at the local level is so crucial to really expanding and building that, um, that, that pipeline of workers who have access to these jobs. Um, another strategy that we see happening across industries is how are we supporting career pathways? And how are we supporting, and this is um, one of the things that, that I, we heard in both Joe and Tony that you brought up as well, is not just how are people entering these jobs, but how are we making sure that participants, particularly women and people of color who don't look like a workforce, or are we making sure that they can stay in these jobs? Um, how can federal policies help support it? How can federal investment help support the kind of things that we know help in, improve retention, whether that's creating and supporting mentoring groups, whether that's child care, transportation. Um, uh, even if your employer is in your backyard, the training provider you may be using may not be. So how are we making sure that people who are in your potential can get to the technical college and back to the employer that are doing their on-the-job training? And if we're talking about that kind of environment, then they certainly have not just the nine to five or the, uh, depending on what shift they are on child care concerns, but they've also got the additional child care concerns. If they're in a night class, um, I know my daughter's child care isn't going to be available for that seven to nine o'clock class. So how are people accessing those services and how are federal investments making sure that that's possible for a different set of uh, workers? Um, and then finally, on that investment in general, um, how are we using what, uh, what, we, what we're hearing from employers and matching where our federal investments are going? Um, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act was passed in 2014 with overwhelming bipartisan support. It had numbers in it of what bipartisan levels of uh, members of Congress said, we should invest this much in the bill, and we haven't seen that level invested since it's been implemented. Instead, over the past two decades, we've seen a 40% decrease in the amount of funding that's gone to support uh, WIOA and its predecessor, WIA. Um, and so we, we hear a lot from the administration, um, from both administrations and the previous and this, and we hear a lot from Congress about the importance of jobs, and we've had employers sitting here saying, this is what we need to get people in these jobs. Um, and so we have to see consistent funding. Although I will say what I thought is that just today, uh, for the first time in more than 20 years, I've received to be uh, poised to pass the funding bill that would fund our workforce and education programs on time. Um, not all the funding bills in Congress will happen on time, but um, that's one of the benefits of going into midterm system. Uh, members want to see funding happen. Um, so, uh, and so really focusing on, on how are we investing in the workforce system in career technical education, there's just uh, recently, a, um, a new uh, bill that, or the bill that funds our current technical education for federal funding was just reauthorized. Um, again, with overwhelming bipartisan support. Um, and we saw a little bit that, that it up to about $70 million more this year in the funding bill that, uh, that's moving forward for uh, education than we have seen in previous years of current technical education. And so there is this recognition that, that there's bipartisan support in improving funding, but we still have a long way to go because. Um, CTE funding is down about 25% over the past two decades. Adult basic education, where we see the kind of education for people who need basic literacy, numeracy skills, and in a way to align that with how we're getting job training skills as well. Um, and 
so, so there's kind of been three main projects that we focus on is really levers to hold to help improve this middle skill access to jobs both so businesses can uh, meet the demand that they have in reach capacity as well as making sure that we have a diverse pipeline and through access to these jobs for all of them. Wonderful. That, that's incredible to hear and um, I'm happy that the funding is going to get to you all the time to do the work that you do. Uh, I recall last year it was our first uh, sort of inaugural panel that, the, that sort of our research department was putting on in terms of water uh, workforce and, and access and so we had Mayor Weaver with us from Flint uh, and Dr. Julianne Malvo moderated and it was this, this a very important discussion but one that talked about sort of the re reaction to um, the, the, the lack of a uh, representative water workforce in terms of uh, the residents of, of Michigan. And as I hear you all talk, I'm reminded about not only bringing opportunity to diversify the workforce, but in within diversity, just explaining why diversity matters. It's not just so people come from different backgrounds, they bring different levels of expertise and experience um, to create innovative solutions. I mean, imagine, for instance, if the water workforce in this state of Michigan, where my brother from Detroit is from, looked like the people of Flint. You know, it might have been that it could, these kinds of things could have been prevented um, when we sort of give these associates sort of the barriers to entry, getting them the jobs, but also letting them do their work because they're not only qualified, but they are going to bring new visions of uh, sort of progressive leadership in the space and make sure that. Uh, that our cities and residents are protected where, uh, wherever they, they are. So I, I do want to move to the sort of workforce development barriers since um, I mentioned that before and in light of the results we're seeing coming out of Joe's report. So before we discuss partnerships uh, working well on the ground, I want to provide some context for the, from the employer perspective since we have representatives here from, from that side about barriers to training and hiring a diverse workforce. So uh, turning back over to, to Tony and Keisha, I mean, your utilities, have a commitment to hire from communities that have been locked out. Uh, that's why you're here, that's why we know each other. Uh, you have models that work, you started with yourselves. I mean, um, and yet, you know, we're still seeing, you know, barriers that communities are facing, particularly from other employer-based colleagues that, that you all have and sort of lifting up and uh, expanding these models. What are, you know, one or two big, you know, kind of barriers that you're seeing uh, that you're facing to make good on this commitment, one of the challenges that you're experiencing, because not everyone has um, a priority on these issues. And so how are you building sort of um, a, a groundswell of support in this space from your colleagues? So not to mention policymakers and all that. And we all, like I said, we all have a role, but in, in, your, in your line of work and what are you seeing is, is still a challenge. Well, I think one of the challenges that we, we appear to be overcoming, just to kind of speak on what, uh, what uh, Katie was saying um, to start with, is the, the lack of funding there's been for workforce development initiatives in the water sector. And for the first time, we have a water workforce development grant um, that has been introduced as part of the, the Water Resources Development Act bill. Conference report was uh, moved forward yesterday by the House and it's being considered by the Senate. Yes, back for that. Um, Senator Booker introduced that bill and we had an opportunity to thank him personally, but in case he happens to see this, we want to thank him again. Um, so, what we see as, as, as uh, challenges mainly is a lack of awareness about utilities and barriers in general. Um, the information in Joe's report was even enlightening to me, and I'm in the water sector. And I think, you know, this room would be filled with standing room only if people knew the capacity of work that exists just between our two utilities. When you run a utility that has a $1.26 billion five-year capital improvement program, $610 million annual operating budget, and we are employing 1,500 people in one utility service area, multiply that times the 410 other large utilities that exist in the United States, and then the 25,000 some odd utilities that exist across the country. Um, there is a lot of opportunity, and we always hear about the need for infrastructure investment in the surface transportation sector, we, we hear very little about what is needed except for the funding gap that exists in the water sector. 
And we, we had a report done by U.S. Water Alliance um, in the last uh, two years ago. They did a report that said that um, while um, investment in surface transportation by the federal sector by the federal government has increased, is decreased by 75% for the water sector, yet we provide an economic impact that is either the same or better in some cases. For every million dollars we spend in capital investment, we're impacting 15 and a half jobs direct, indirect, and induced. So the, just the general lack of awareness about the facts and what we provide and what we bring to the table in terms of of our funding, because this is money that's being spent by our rate payers to, when they pay their water and sewer bills, it should go back into the community in terms of supporting jobs. And then in general, there's just been no formal structure for um, utilities to leverage all the stakeholders around workforce development and education. Um, that's why we're putting together a workforce development structure in, in Atlanta and then modeling our K through 12 program after San Francisco PUC's Big Ideas curricu curriculum where they work with the San Francisco school system um, to infuse that curriculum into the master curriculum and then work with the state to tie it to state science standards. So essentially you have utilities, utility by utility, with the exception of the 20 uh, utilities and the Water Agency Leaders Alliance that have been working one by one to tackle these challenges themselves, and now we're kind of banding together and coalescing around the, the things that we know works. And I would say the second biggest challenge for us is literacy. Um, we see a high rate of, of illiteracy in uh, the communities that we're in. Most of our facilities are in these communities. Wastewater treatment plants are generally in uh, in communities that are underserved and largely African American. Um, and, and literacy is a challenge. Even though there are low barriers to entry to most of the positions that we have, um, many don't have a high school diploma or a GED, and you need that to get licensed. You need that to get some of the certifications that are required to do some of these jobs. So while you don't have to go to college, you do have to have some level of literacy because after all, we are dealing with public health when you're talking about safe, clean drinking water. And so those are just some of the challenges that we see. Thank you also for, thank you for that comment. Thank you also for, for mentioning that because there is diversity in terms of barriers of entry too. So uh, while relative to other sectors, there are perhaps relatively less barriers. When you look at the populations in these cities, you actually find that um, that, that they still have barriers because they don't even have that sort of basic level of um, resources. And yet they are, they are right there. Again, I, you, like the geographic proximity of these neighborhoods is also something to look at. I mean, it's not like you're reaching a population on the other side of the country. I mean, there are things you can do to partner with others. And I, I was really overwhelmed. I mean, we went, when I went on this Hetch Hetchy tour, because not only did we go to the dam, we actually went to, I believe, the southeast San Francisco that sounds like the right yeah. southeast, yeah. So we went into the neighborhood where uh, where SFPUC, which has the is the only utilities with a community benefits program, are literally talking to the community here, um, making sure that uh, liquor stores are turned into teacher training facilities. I mean, you know, we were meeting with community people that were not even in the water sector, but I, I appreciated seeing that kind of effort. It, you know, it doesn't have to always be uh, necessarily sort of a top-down, you know, you've got folks fighting at the federal level, but really when you just go into the community and you let people know you're here, you build the trust of the community, and you're absolutely right. I, I think there's a huge learning curve because I have no doubt as soon as we find a way to message this to those of us in the policy space, maybe not water like you all, this room will be filled. I mean, because these are incredible statistics. It is incredible. I mean, you get paid more, the barriers to entry are, are less, the jobs are there because the aging workforce is retiring, the baby boomers are heading out, and, and so it's, it, you know, it's just about uh, you know, getting the word out, and you're right, the communities will, will definitely come. I, I do want to give Tony a chance to respond to, to uh, the same question around sort of challenges that you might be experiencing or your efforts to try to get more support on this. Well, you know, I think I mentioned uh, once we did the uh, meeting four years ago, 
uh, a study did reflect that the majority of utilities that were involved in the study, and it was about 25 or 30 different cities. But what it said was is that our capital program and our operating budgets uh, would sustain 300,000 jobs, new jobs, on an annual basis for the next 10 years. And so that's 300,000 jobs. So now that we have this information, how do we get it out to the community? How do we get the information out to uh, the trade schools? How do we get information out to the high schools? Uh, and so a lot of cities are starting to develop partnerships with their local public schools. Uh, one of the challenges we have is that a lot of the public schools are kind of partitioned now into different programs, uh, particularly in Louisville, uh, if you want to pursue a, a, a future in acting or a future in something else. And so you've got to identify what schools within your community are for a uh, skilled workforce or for uh, STEM programs or those type of schools, <coughs> excuse me, then develop partnerships so that, you know, the internships or in our case, we also have started a summer uh, program where we bring in students uh, to embed them inside our utility for an eight week period so they can be mentored, they can also get a feel for what it's like to work for a utility and what type of career paths exist in the utility. So that's one way that we're trying to overcome the barrier. Um, I think the other uh, barrier we have is you know, we talk about affordability and, the, and those type of things, but there's also a lack of compassion. From our leaders, there's a lack of compassion and caring about how do we address <clears throat> the issue of precipitism? Uh, how do we address the issue of dealing with effective reentry programs? Uh, how do we deal with the unemployment rate, uh, particularly in our urban core communities? Uh, I know in Milwaukee and Buffalo and, and Louisville, we're actually a part of a national uh, coalition and Atlanta uh, putting together what we call a water equity roadmap. And what types of programs and partnerships we need to develop to make sure that we're addressing the issue of reentry and, and addressing the issue of, 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 of inclusion from the African American uh, standpoint. Uh, those water equity roadmaps uh, are a series of meetings that are being happening uh, regionally across the country. I think I think the next one is in Atlanta. Uh, but you have you know over a dozen cities that are coming together and having discussions about how are we going to specifically address this issue, of making sure that we put people to work. And so those partnerships are really broader than just the water utility itself. We got to have transportation. Uh, at the table, we have to have uh, discussions with workforce agencies that are already active in our cities and our states and tapping into the funds that they are getting from the federal government. We also have to have uh, partnerships with uh, our veteran community. Uh, there's a lot of folks that are coming back from uh, armed services and, and others that can be integrated back into our cities and our, and our programs. So, through the uh, U.S. Water Alliance and the Water Equity Roadmap Program, we're very active in that. Um, and I think the, the final thing I'll just add, and it's kind of going back to the uh, uh, issue of local hire, uh, working with uh, the Urban League uh, and other communities that already have these contractor training programs or other programs that are already ready to be tapped making sure that you're developing those partnerships and not reinventing the wheel, and uh, really coming together collaboratively and building a strong coalition with uh, uh, the NAACP, uh, the Urban League, uh, your local transportation uh, authorities, and uh, any state workforce authorities that may be active in your, in, your, in your city. So those are some of the things that we're doing. Great. Um, and also, I love that you you are talking about this uh, sort of notion of outreach to the different populations, and particularly those in reentry. Um, at the foundation, we were working with the NEKC Foundation's Juvenile uh, Detention.
Coalition Alternative Initiatives since 2005. And um, actually, we were doing work initially around um, it, uh, workforce development with regard to environmental sustainability. So uh, no bias from Michigan, I'm from Ohio, but this example has to do with the, the Detroit workers for environmental justice. And they got funding from DOL, and uh, we came to find out through working with Annie Casey that um, they were actually targeting long-term unemployed folks in the Detroit area. And so not only did they provide them training with job recruitment later, but it came with um, them understanding at a very practical level they need to reach these populations. So what I mean by that is they would subsidize travel for these long-term unemployed people from their home to their office to get training at a very elementary level. I mean, you can have the great a great training program, but these folks have been on the foot for a while, so getting a bus ride or getting a ride, period, uh, from where they live to take advantage of these, we have to think through all of those elements. And so, um, you know, even even as I'm best to hear you speak, Tony, I'm also thinking about, and we've been working with the Anti-Recidivism Coalition in, um, in LA, uh, run by Scott Budnick, and it's run by former young youth uh, who were incarcerated. And it's, it's run by those same young people. And I mean, there is an intersection there because those folks are also uh, more likely to have less educational attainment, but need a pipeline to work. And so there, maybe you all are already working in this space, but that's certainly an area that, that I see a huge you know, uh, connection. So I, I, I'm, I'm happy that you mentioned that. Um, I, before we turn to questions, and we will, I, I do want to have, I have one last question for, for the panel. Um, about scale and sort of lifting up these models that are actually working um, in terms of uh, people that are being trained for actual jobs and what it is that we should actually focus on um, when you think about what has been working well. So if you all can discuss an example um, of a successful partnership, and I know you just mentioned some Tony as well, uh, to address uh, workforce needs in the water sector. I know in uh, with SFPUC, Bay Work is a regional consortium of uh, 28 San Francisco Bay Area wa water and waste water utilities that are collaborating to build career pipelines in the water utility sector. Um, and you know, Tony, you mentioned the job portal. You know, so what do these successful models of partnership look like? Um, if, if I want to leave that with the panel before we go to questions. Well, so, some of the some examples of things that we're doing. We have three uh, programs that we've kicked off under our um, workforce development program, which we call Streamwork, which is a model of the uh, of the. It, it's kind of a replication of the Bay Work program. Um, it's our internal work, internal and external workforce development framework. Um, so the the three programs that we have engaged in so far are called My Journey Matters which is focused on um, tapping the youth offenders. So we have uh, some youth that have been employed after they have successfully gone through a program, uh, if they've gotten into some trouble and, and been uh, recommended for this program uh, by, the, by the judge. Um, and then we have the PAT3 partnership which is, uh, with the Department of Corrections which is our focused reentry program for nonviolent offenders. Um, this past year, or earlier this year, we announced the program in partnership with Department of, the city's Department of Corrections, the state Department of Corrections, Urban League, uh, and ourselves, where we're providing the, well, the job training and certification training for eight individuals that have been incarcerated and were eligible for uh, release. Um, the success story there is that one individual has already been released. He was released a year early, um, partly because um, he had a job to go to. Uh, so as he said, instead of being um, released with $25 and a bus ticket, he was uh, released to a job um, in training to get his water distribution certification. Um, and I think he had something close to $7,000 in the bank um, because he, they're getting paid while, while they're there. So this gives them an opportunity to start providing for their children again. The, the uh, Chief Labat uh, wanted to focus on uh, fathers to start the program. And uh, we're looking at taking another 10 individuals through that program and, and looking
looking at some other critical hard to fill positions. So this has given us an opportunity to fill some positions that were um, that we have been unable to fill for a long, a long period of time. And then uh, the last program, which is relatively new, uh, we haven't inked the agreement yet, but we've been working with a group called Wellspring Living to pilot a program that would assist uh, females that have been victims of sex trafficking to allow them an opportunity to uh, reestablish um, a, a stable life for them. Um, so those are what we're trying to do as an anchor institution in the city of Atlanta is um, knowing that we have workforce challenges is on the one hand build our own pipelines, but we've turned to, um, to giving folks an opportunity that wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity to enter a stable workforce. And uh, so far it's working, and um, I think that's what you know, part of our mission is, is to, to, to be um, a utility of consequence where we're giving more of ourselves than just providing safe, safe clean drinking water and treating wastewater. Oh, you just go back. Yeah, I would um, just like to uh, mention earlier, I talked about us doing a disparity study and the fact that, you know, uh, the period that we looked at, we had spent uh, over a five year period, $675 million. And the fact that $650 million of that work had went to non-African American owned companies. And so one of the things that I said when we got that data back was is that it was disheartening, uh, it was appalling, and uh, we need to do something to make sure that we are doing better as far as economic inclusion for African American owned companies. And here's why. Because when we are giving African American owned companies opportunities, they get a chance to build their companies, uh, which they also have an opportunity to hire uh, from the community uh, to address some of the issues that need to be addressed. And so an example of that is we start to utilize more companies. Uh, one good example is, is uh, one of our construction projects, it was a $60 million uh, combined sewer overflow basin project that was done in the middle of Shawnee Park, which is in the west end of Wolf, which is um, predominantly African American owned uh, or uh, neighborhood. One of the things that we did with our contractor was we made them commit to, uh, I think they almost, it was close to 70% local hire uh, as part of that contract. And so, so far what we've seen with about 100 and, uh, 40 workers that may be involved with that project, uh, they are almost meeting the 70% local hire. And then on top of that, about 12% of that is from the community in which we're doing the work. And so those are the type of things that we're trying to connect with the community, with the contractor, so that you know uh, folks are getting those opportunities. Uh, the other thing that we're doing is looking at more of what we call project labor agreements with the uh, labor uh, or the labor unions that are going to be uh, doing work as part of our, our contractors and making sure that even though, you know, like for example in Kentucky, it's not a right to work or it's not a, uh, a prevailing wage state, you still gotta have those partnerships with uh, the labor unions to make sure that you're pulling from not only uh, the local community, but also from the skill sets that you need. Uh, and so project labor agreements are gonna be another big part of us going forward, make sure we have that partnership. And then finally, uh, reaching out more in the community, working with uh, organizations that are affiliated with our churches. Uh, we have programs that, uh, one is called Jesus Sent a Job. Uh, uh, you know Jesus Sent a Job? That's an amen right here. <laughs> but, but those are the type of organizations that are affiliated with our with our pastors and our churches, uh, and they are helping us get the word out for opportunities that we have with our utility, and uh, we're just so excited about that. Um, and then, as Keisha mentioned, the program that they are doing in Atlanta to address reentry is probably the model that every 
every city needs to take a look at. Uh, I know that we've started to take a look at it. Uh, we've had meetings with not only our local uh, corrections uh, unit in Louisville, but also uh, getting ready to meet with the state corrections folks to see how we can kind of mirror a very similar program that they're doing in Atlanta. So uh, those are the things that we're working on. Uh, I can share some examples um, from outside of the water sector thinking about how that applies to the workforce more broadly. So, um, although I will start with one from the workforce, or from the water sector again. So, um, they work uh, in San Francisco. They used, um, every stake is an allocation under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act to support the workforce development at the state level. And uh, governors have flexibility. They have what's called a 15% set aside. So 15% of that money, governors are able to spend on innovative projects. Um, and uh, San Francisco tapped into part of that funding in order to do their analysis of what the water workforce can look like over uh, the, I think it was over a decade. Um, and so, so using that funding and tapping into where there is flexibility at the state level and the local level with the workforce system was really crucial um, to, to their ability to map out what do uh, the utilities in the area need, what are the community and technical colleges currently offering, how can we fill the gaps between that, how can we recruit students and participate those programs. Um, uh, so thinking about those connections with the workforce system, um, even if the one stop isn't necessarily uh, industry's first place for recruitment, it can be a really great partner. Um, and they're also, even though it's underfunded, there can be some flexibility there. Um, uh, and it's intended in its latest iteration to be really industry driven. Um, another example I'll give of using that 15% set aside fund is Georgia. I don't know if you um, have accessed any of this or work with any of these partnerships, but the state of Georgia uh, created um, what they called the High Demand Career Initiative, um, where it started as a state level program, where they mapped out what were the high demand careers in the state, um, and what they quickly learned after doing their initial analysis was that even the state level is too broad, and so they really narrowed down to what's happening at the local level, how can we support those partnerships between local employers, local colleges, local chambers of commerce, all those different entities, obviously local employers, um, to make sure that where we're investing funding is really driven by where there is that local need. Um, one of their partnerships is in healthcare, and I think there's a lot of comparison that can happen between the stackable credentials, the curved pathways, um, the kind of education entry requirements and on the job training that can, it can really lead to uh, progression within the industry in healthcare and in the water workforce. Um, and uh, one of the ways that, that this healthcare partnership in Georgia has been able to expand the pipeline of workers who have access to jobs by tapping into a, a relatively flexible funding source under um, supplemental nutrition programs, under SNAP, there's an employment and training arm of that federal funding that when local areas uh, match a certain amount of federal funding, they can get 50% of their costs for employment and training reimbursed from the federal government. Um, and so they're accessing some of the SNAP ENT funds to train workers for, for entry-level healthcare careers. So training folks who uh, are, are getting SNAP benefits um, so that they can get better jobs and get off of SNAP. Um, and, and not just creating that first entry-level job in the healthcare system, but they're also working with um, additional funding that's coming from the workforce system uh, to, to, to provide additional and stackable training. So the training leads into, once uh, folks get their uh, the entry-level job and certificate, after six months on the job, they're eligible for their apprenticeship program. And apprenticeship right now is really hot from a bipartisan lens in, in D.C. and in many states. And um, but, but what often gets lost in that conversation is that apprenticeship has a lot of uh, entry requirements. And for, for folks who don't have a high school diploma or don't have a ton of work experience, that's not the first step along the career pathway. There's got to be training that happens first. And so that's what this partnership in, in uh, North Georgia has been able to access in that healthcare industry is not just how are we getting folks into a healthcare apprenticeship, but how are we getting folks to training one step before that so they can really access a pathway and so that we're able to tap into more flexible and greater funding sources that we have at the federal and state level because we're using both resources available under SNAP ENT, tapping into what's possible under TANF and other safety net programs, and using those to structure a pathway that works for people who need the most skills gains. Um, and then one other piece I'll add to that um, is that in Mississippi, uh, there's a program called Mississippi Women in Construction that is accessing some of the, the state TANF funds 
um, funds that the state has from TANF, and, um, and are using those funds to support a year of child care for pre-apprenticeship participants. So when participants go to this 12-week pre-apprenticeship program, they get paid child care while they're in the program, as well as for the program varies from eight to 12 weeks, but they get it for an entire year. So even once they're in an apprenticeship program or another job after graduation of this program, they still have that funding to support their child care, which, like the uh, like you were mentioning with bus tickets, when you bet someone is long-term employed, the idea of going into a and getting their first or second or third paycheck, there's a lot of places that paycheck needs to go, and child care can be a huge barrier for folks in the large costs. And so having this covered, even once they're getting that paycheck, has enabled them to to something like quadruple the number of women that they're serving in their program because they have the funding for these women to stay in the program and to stay in the jobs once they're there. Great, thank you. I'll try to be brief. No problem. You <laughs> got to come to the audience. Uh, yes. Look, I think this issue of scale is hugely yes. important. I, I think overall, I'm trying to hear Keisha and Katie. I mean, there are no one size fits all approaches to this. That if anything, there's kind of this experimentation and then the question is replication, right, from place to place. So how can you take what, what Atlanta is doing or what Louisville is doing and begin translating that in all types of places, not just sort of bigger markets, right, or even urban markets, but also smaller places, rural places all across all across the country. And, and so as I kind of alluded to before, I, I really see this ladder of, of action that needs to, to happen that we kind of highlight in our report, which really starts to be at a, at a local level, right, very much by the employers, which are talking about and how are you beginning to empower staff and how are you beginning to uh, adjust the existing procedures and pilot some of these more flexible training programs to actually make make this change possible and so this means right even training having skilled workers to reach out to prospective workers right you need to have skilled staff on staff <laughs> to reach the, the the types of population you're hoping to reach and, and so you know, that's part of this a branding strategy right and i know baltimore has been thinking about this as well it's trying to get an intuitive compelling message to the community that you know, you can get very wonky <laughs> in terms of the, the sort of the water terminology and all of that, but you really have to make a compelling, quick message, I think, to, to prospective candidates or even for workers who are looking at that, that career change. Um, and it can be as simple also, I'll just say, of, of reaching out to, to students right, and member of others too. And, and so one place we haven't mentioned who's on the, the blog group is, is Camden, New Jersey. Um, and so they're a slightly smaller utility. Um, obviously, Camden is a place with some significant environmental and economic challenges, but even if a place like Camden is trying to do something about this, right, without the capacity, the technical and fiscal capacity, they are trying to do something about this. That to me is very compelling, right, for other places that go, hey, where are we? <laughs> Why are we not taking the lead here? And, and so they're looking at this in terms of, I'll just mention one of their programs, the Green Jobs and Ambassadors program, where they're trying to provide just a quick immersive experience for high school students, even over the summer, just to get a feel for what is water work, right, where for students may not even know um, right now. And, and I know that, uh, might be in Atlanta and Louisville and elsewhere, but even mentorships, right? So how can you connect with sort of existing workers, right, to younger prospective workers, creating that sort of that common point where they can reach out to them after their internship is over, right? I think it's hugely important. But you know, in all honesty, utilities and employers can't do this by themselves. They do need that capacity um, at, at a regional scale and then crucially, as Ms. Katie was mentioning, at a federal sort of national scale. So, so to me, it's, it's again reaching out to some of these other community partners educational institutions, uh, labor groups, workforce development boards, uh, other even other employers, right? Because there is scarce talent in many markets. And so how can employers even be more collaborative in trying to reach these workers as opposed to just competing against each other, trying to hoard the talent just for themselves, which I think is just a natural inclination here. Um, so and I'd say at a national level, you know, more funding wouldn't hurt. <laughs> but but um, I think just having a greater awareness of what's out there, right? So as much as we're talking about you know, the fact that there was just a lack of a landing page, right, for best practices, or even just a guide or a template, right, that all places can follow to begin. So where do I start, right? <laughs> like, it's great that, that, you know, San Francisco is doing this, and other places are doing this, but how do I begin to translate this to my market, I think is, is helpful. And to me, that's where sort of a federal national perspective can help, right, build the scale that I think could, could resonate across the country. Yeah. No, thank you for that. I, I appreciate it. And just like you said, being here today now, you know, more, more to find out about what's going on. I mean, the fact also, I think, you know, the Water Alliance, because you, know, you have invested in us with a job opportunity. So now we can offer a young person uh, to your fellowship to work with us. Uh, I know with um, API in the energy space, they have the sort of employment side of, 
of the piece has to be shared as well. And so they've been bringing in, you know, CDCF, CHCI, you know, uh, the Asian Pacific American Organization, all these different entities uh, that are operating to build jobs for minority communities, literally into their offices and talk about, help us create the strategy, you know. And so I, I'm happy to see this uh, happening across different STEM spaces, but just overall. So, um, you know, it's, it, we thank you all for joining us uh, even here at the Indian Legislative Conference. And this is really one of the last uh, massive sort of convening of policymakers, uh, civil rights leaders, um, business experts, community activists, uh, you know, with every CBC member uh, present. I mean, there really is nothing like it. So coming here, you reach masses of, uh, of, of different populations and people, and that's really where it starts. So so thank you to you all. What I want to do now is come to you. I believe you have a, a mic for me. Um, I'm going to come down there and join you. So uh, we have a good 30 minutes for discussion. So if you can state you know, your name, your affiliation, and, and ask a question, we can have a good dialogue. We have a nice intimate panel today, too, so we should be able to get um, panel and audience, we should be able to get a nice conversation going. So I'll continue. Thank you. Uh, my name is Robert Drummer of uh, Drummer Associates, a law firm here in town that uh, does lobby on infrastructure. Uh, I used to work for the city of Atlanta for uh, Mayor Franklin on this project, so I'm glad to see all of you here. I uh, actually got a couple of questions. I know we cover uh, a lot of issues here today, um, but uh, one of the questions is uh, from a policy perspective, uh, you talked about various grant programs, but uh, kind of forward thinking wise, there have been talks of a uh, water infrastructure bank or a, a water trust fund similar to the highway trust fund. If, if you guys could just maybe share your perspectives on those type of innovative policy initiatives, as well as uh, there's a growing uh, use of public private partnerships around the country, particularly in water infrastructure. So you want to also get your perspectives on how can you partner with those private sector entities for workforce development. Well, I can start. I'm so glad you raised the, because uh, I, I haven't heard anybody ask the question about water trust funds, um, like the highway trust fund, but that is something that we absolutely have talked about. And uh, when we provided comments to um, various folks on, um, for the infrastructure bill, or the, what was supposed to be the infrastructure bill, uh, we we included that as um, as as a measure of, of implementation that we should take a look at. Um, the the pushback has always been that oh the, the highway trust fund is is funded by gas tax, um, but if you really look at how it's been funded uh, most most recently, there's been general fund dollars that have been put to that. And so there, there has to be a way to develop um, a, a, a similar funding mechanism, because this is the thing, and having managed a public works agency in Jackson, I got to see firsthand when we, uh, we submitted projects for Tiger Grant funding, we got um, some significant funding for two projects. We only had to put up a 20% match for elective roadway projects. When the city exceeded the lead action level, we had to take out an emergency loan. We couldn't get a grant. We had to take out an emergency loan that the city would have to pay back. There is, uh, there is an extreme imbalance in the way we fund infrastructure in this country and the way we look at what critical infrastructure needs require from a federal level on down. So we would fully support that. And one of the things that we've been working with through our partnership under the Urban Waters Program with EPA, Federal Highway Administration to develop an integrated water resources management plan for just our Proctor Creek watershed is uh, innovative financing models to include possibly development of an infrastructure bank ourselves. So I think it, that there is there's one example that we found, an infrastructure bank was developed in Chicago um, the, 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 the challenge was getting 
um, interest from the private sector so that they could realize the return on investment. Um, but I think that if the right people are working on it, it's certainly something that can be done. If I could just <clears throat> add one comment relative to the uh, uh, trust. You know, one of the things, and she's right, we've been talking about it for a decade, uh, but what is going to be the funding source? I would add that, uh, particularly with wastewater, what impacts our system a lot is uh, what people flush down the toilet. And so maybe there needs to be some type of discussion around those companies that produce uh, lights and, and things that, that, that are flushable to see if that's a possibility of getting some type of uh, source for a, a trust fund. Uh, there's also uh, utilities are going to be impacted significantly in the future with regulations dealing with nutrient removal. Uh, but so when you think about those companies that uh, make uh, soap powders and, and those type of things that uh, fertilizers and those type of things that end up in our system that we as the public owned treatment works have to treat and meet federal guidelines and if we don't the federal government puts us under these things called consent decrees that impacts the uh, communities that we serve even further and so it's kind of like we're chasing our tail here instead of going after POTWs we need to be going after the sources that are impacting our cost and impacting the regulators uh, or the regulations that we have to comply with. Uh, secondly, as it relates to uh, funding, uh, I'm a part of the US EPA Environmental Financial Advisory Board, and one of the projects uh, that we're looking at is how do we start to fund regionalization of utilities, uh, whether that's through a program called WIFIA, uh, and also uh, through other public-private partnerships. Uh, so I think we're going to hear more about that as we move forward in the future. But as far as P3s, I think that uh, when you think about the utility of the future, we have to be receptive to public-private par partnerships, provided that those partnerships have the same interest that we as publicly-owned utilities have, and that is making sure that we have local hires, making sure that we have economic uh, but I think there's some advantages of having uh, partnerships with uh, public private entities. I just, I just quickly add just three points. Uh, one side I like to cite is that 95% of public spending every year on water is at a state and local level. So <laughs> if you think that the federal slice of that pie is only 5% at the moment, clearly there is room for additional federal infrastructure investment in water just across the board, <laughs> right, regardless of sort of workforce. But I'd add also sort of with this national sort of perspective, we need to have an economic vision, right? There doesn't need to be just sort of this sort of pay for question like I feel in Washington, you have to just jump to how are we gonna pay for it. What, what are we spending money on? Like what is the strategy here? And so, you know, we have our transportation on one side, we have our energy on the other side, we have water here. So to me, what I, I think Tony mentioned this earlier, why are we not having transportation employers talking with water employers, talking with energy employers to make this an economic issue, a workforce issue, not just sort of an isolated infrastructure issue. Uh, and third, I would say as it relates to sort of the P3 bit, um, it's still very nascent <laughs> across the country. There are very few models that you can point to on that. But um, in all of this, I would say the idea of pilots, right, rather than sort of broader national we were to jump into the deep end and do all this at once, as much as we can be iterative and intentional, I think, about how we experiment and play with this, I think it, it makes more sense. Uh, great uh, presentation all. Michael Smith, uh, Houston, Texas, and also representing Texas Southern University. My question to you is on the, on the upper scale of Joseph's uh, piece, I know entry-level um, job positions target rich environment. But uh, in our uh, College of Science, Engineering, and Technology, we just uh, three years ago we opened, started a civil engineering program, and uh, this spring we'll have our first uh, class of civil engineering graduates. And uh, we've been working with the city of Houston to uh, uh, work, working it now to get an MOU in place so that we can um, put our engineering students in internships and things of that nature. Um, the question. Uh, I would have for Ms. Powell and Mr. Perrett, Perrett. Uh, would be, um, 
what can we as HBCUs uh, do to position ourselves to get visibility with, with local uh, utility companies, uh, uh, office of water resource companies and things of that nature. And then what uh, can the public utilities uh, do to uh, bring vision to HBCUs conversely to, to match those uh, uh, job opportunities on the other scale? Because obviously we need entry level workers going into the, uh, the nuts and bolts and the application piece, but also you need um, uh, those um, um, talent to come in at the visionary stage and the, the, the uh, theoretical stage and some of those kinds of things. So, a question for you. No, first of all, thank you uh, for your question. Um, two points. Uh, one thing that I would say is um, we often hear that, particularly those uh, students that are graduating as civil engineers, private sector really sucks them up. And so the public utilities, we have not made a concerted effort to actually get out there and, to your point, visit uh, historically black uh, colleges or being partners with uh, agencies such as NSBE uh, to make sure that we are communicating to them so they know the type of opportunities that we have in this sector. So I think that what we need to do, obviously, we've already started reaching out to Nesby and making sure that we have a connection with them. Um, and we need to, and maybe you can assist us, is how do we make sure that we are connected with those uh, historically black colleges that really have the professional engineering programs. An example, uh, Five years ago, when I was in Cincinnati, we actually developed a partnership with Central State University uh, with uh, their program up there. And, uh, they had a program of environmental science uh, program, so we actually brought in five interns from that program every summer so that they could be connected with the utility and also create that pipeline between Central State and the utility. So uh, I would say that those type of partnerships are things that we need to be doing in the utility sector um, to raise awareness and open door and opportunities for those students that are pursuing a career path in the public sector. I, I would say because I, I attended Oregon State University and the last two years that I was in school I was an intern with the city of Baltimore Bureau of Water and Wastewater which then I ended up going back to run. But um, the, the the partnership that they had at the time was very loose. And there wasn't a structure in place to actually capture the students. Um, so I, while I was there as an intern, I didn't really think about um, continuing on as a full-time employee because there wasn't that focus. Um, and what I saw with our counterparts on the electrical engineering side who had partnerships with Robert Grumman and um, some of the other, Raytheon and, and others in the, in the electrical engineering space, was those companies had something to offer the universities in the way of funding right. and uh, promising a certain level of jobs, scholarships, uh, and that. So it was more attractive and the partnership worked a little better in the electrical on the electrical engineering side. I think since then, our colleague Rudy Chow in Baltimore has developed um, a very firm uh, partnership with, uh, with the city of Baltimore to provide internship opportunities. But I think there does have to be um, somewhat of an exchange developed, um, even if it is providing uh, folks at the utility an opportunity for um, continue, continuing education opportunities at the university uh, or working collaboratively to develop a scholarship program uh, or even if it's for book assistance. But there ha the, the, the problem sometimes is the draw of students to, to be in these programs because civil engineering can, can, it crosses so many different sectors. 
Um, and folks tend to those sectors that have the sexy opportunities. I mean, as, sure. as Tony said, um, especially in this day and age, we're, we're seeing the, the millennial effect. You know, you go a couple layers younger um, and trying to capture their interest and figure out how to capitalize on those things they're interested in, we have to do a better job of that. Yeah. And I think it just takes working with the local utility to figure out what their workforce needs will be for the future and what your curriculum looks like and how those two things can be married so that you really create uh, an, an opportunity to capture their interests and educate them in areas that they'll actually use when they enter the job the, the job market in, in the utilities. But there, there needs to be a little bit more meat on the bones than just giving internship opportunities. Thank you. Uh, did you want to say something? I'll, I'll integrate it. Okay, okay. Um, just a time, quick time check. 14 minutes, and I'm glad we have a, a line now of questions. So if we could just keep it brief, and then towards the end, if we have to, to sort of take two or three at once, we'll do that. So. Good afternoon. Great panel. Appreciate you guys being here. I'm Taft Gaddy, President, CEO of Artesian Water Partners, and my uh, STEM nonprofit <coughs> Uh, steam H2O for life. Uh, Artesian Water Partners, we produce uh, water fil filtration systems, uh, reverse osmosis, conditioners, and softeners. With, uh, and Mr. Waterman, he's a superhero that promotes clean, healthy water to children and their parents to combat childhood obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, and uh, cholesterol. So I created this character to show parents of the importance of helping their kids with clean, healthy water. But more importantly, I created a clean water initiative to show students how to make reverse osmosis water systems with my STEAM H2O for Life, which is a STEM project. First question is, how can I get uh, some funding from the STEAM H2O? Then secondly, what is the likelihood of municipalities understanding the infrastructure of how we can solve the water problems? I have solutions. I've been in the water since 1989. And the solution to solving our water problem is to make sure that we clean the water at the point of entry where the water comes into our buildings, our schools, our homes. We clean the water there, and then we clean it at the point of, uh, point of use. It's a two-step process. That will alleviate all the problems to our water sources. Then also, with that, it will save on cleaning. Uh, it will save on the scale building up in the pipes and the boiler systems. It will save so much money, millions and billions of dollars will be saved by conditioning water prior to it touching utilities and other appliances in our buildings. What would be the likelihood of that being introduced uh, to a, a team of uh, uh, people that are considering uh, making sure that we don't have the best water possible? How do we all understand that we can not undo all the dangers to our water sources that have taken decades of ignorance and abuse to inflict? So we alone will safeguard what we drink the water and the water we serve. I just want to know how can we, or me, be a part of something like that, an ambassador to clean up the water. That's what I do. I've been doing it a long, long time. It's time for a break. Is that a statement or a question? <laughs> it's a question. No, it's, it's a question. No, I, uh, you know, I, I obviously I agree with you with what you're trying to do. Um, I would strongly <coughs> encourage you to reach out to the Water Research Foundation if you have not. Uh, they're always interested in looking at partnerships and they have uh, funding and grant opportunities for companies uh, like yours that are working to, uh, you know, get more uh, treatment uh, technologies or uh, even product uh, in the areas where it is needed. Uh, you know, as we, and there's also an opportunity for maybe you to partner with uh, the Red Cross and other uh, entities that may be responding to uh, catastrophic storm events in areas like <laughs> what we're experiencing today down in North Carolina, South Carolina. Um, but I think what you're doing is, is, is great. Thank you. An incredible panel of experts. It's really refreshing for someone like myself, who is, I'm Ken Duncan. I'm a commissioner of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago. And 
I'm in awe of the depth of talent, the talent and knowledge. I'm already fantastic. Uh, just so sort of FYI, um, we are one of we're the largest, probably one of the most sophisticated systems in the world. Uh, we are looking for an executive director. We pay about three hundred thousand dollars. We have almost two thousand employees and a one point three billion dollar budget. So we'd love to talk with you after, afterwards uh, to put you in the network. Uh, keep up the great work of information. Thank you. That's great. Got job opportunities all around up in here. I love it. All right. Yeah, all right. Hello. My name is Eugene Tucker. Right now, um, I'm attending a historic black college, HBCU. Uh, I attend the University of the District of Columbia. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois. Right I just moved out about three weeks ago. And um, I've been inspired to start a nonprofit by um, an organization called Tabula Ross. I used to work for in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, they basically uh, handled um, like recidivism when it comes to like reentry for uh, felons. So um, I was I was the outreach client. I was the outreach coordinator at Tabula Ross in Chicago, and I was just. I'm uh, wondering, um, when it comes to my own organization, uh, how do you know? How do I like uh, connect with those um, those institutions as far as like the people I heard? Uh, you, I heard you just talking about it. Like maybe when I first came in um, to you know like basically um, received information on how to initiate uh, some sort of partnership with those agencies for applying um, for, for you, for basically like um, having those uh, individuals that's coming into the re-entry to um, use it basically to get a, some sort of um, partnership going on. Uh, yeah. Where are you looking to develop, establish? Yes, I've already established in Chicago. Okay. Um, so here in DC? No, not in DC. Uh, in Chicago. Oh, but, in but Chicago. you moved from UD. You're yes, in I moved from Chicago yeah. to Washington DC about three weeks ago. Okay. So are you looking to establish something here in DC? Would no, you, not. I'm uh, not. Well, well, where? Just in general? Just in general. Yeah, I think you um, need to to visit with the local utility. Um, I can tell you in DC, there is a new uh, general manager who um, is very invested in, in some of the same types of initiatives. His name is David Gaddis um, in Chicago. You know, whoever the, the new executive there, I'm sure would be interested. To, uh, you know, we've worked with Chicago uh, previously as part of Wawa. And um, I think that there, you know, there's 20 utilities working across the country um, in the Water Agency Leaders Alliance from the East Coast to the West Coast, North and South. Um, but then there's also the U.S. Water Alliance, who's working on the water sector equity um, framework. And there are six utilities that are engaged in that. Both uh, Tony and I are part of that initiative. So I think. Um, starting there, the local utility, but also reaching out to the U.S. Water Alliance and um, uh, WEF is is very engaged. The Water Environment Federation, and I would say right now, every because there's going to be a national workforce convening in uh, in a month or so in Alexandria, Virginia, that is spearheaded by. EPA, WEF, and the other water sector uh, nonprofit agencies. Everybody in the sector is very focused on workforce development right now. So we'd be hard pressed to find uh, a group in the water sector that is not trying to do something to further um, uh, improve the, the workforce um, development initiatives and challenges that we have right now. 
I think we've come a long way in the, the, in the two years that I've been in Atlanta. I've seen things grow by leaps and bounds in that space. I would also urge you on the, the workforce side. So every every local area, generally cities, the, the, the District of Columbia has a, a workforce one stop, a workforce system, a workforce board. Um, the board's comprised of industry leaders um, as well as folks who are running nonprofits, community based organizations. Chicago has a number of them. I think there's seven local areas just in, in greater Chicago alone. Um, there's a number of funding streams from the federal government, including national grant programs under the Department of Labor funding that many of the groups, I don't know if uh, there is a, a local uh, recipient of, of one of the grant programs in particular in Chicago, but there are, all, you know, thinking about both the, the entry into the industry side, but also the fact that the workforce system in your local area um, works with nonprofits who are offering opportunities to a uh, diverse set of, the, the, um, of workers. In particular, under uh, WIO, it's really targeted at folks who have barriers to entry, and that includes uh, folks who are re-entering. Great. You should get their cards after this. Oh, yeah. No problem. Thanks. So thank you. Uh, we have five minutes left, and I want to make sure we get our lovely ladies here in. So we're going to take these three questions, and you can answer them, and then we'll close out. I actually only get four questions. So I'm not saying I'm only going to make two questions, but I'm going to be very quickly. Thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate the information. My name is Justine Johnson. The first question I have for you all is in terms of, I've heard a lot about partnerships, but in terms of broad information sharing, for example, utility bills are a great way to do outreach in terms of job opportunities and connecting businesses and residents. And what tactics and tools are you all using in terms of using the methods that you have now to connect with people? Question one, and how does that also relate to the public education system? That's a great time for a child to learn. I've never, in the whole process of my public school education, no one ever showed me a utility bill. So I just want to just state that. Part two of the question is how do you see the tech sector either supporting or potentially challenging the workforce in terms of uh, the water sector? So those are my two questions. Thank you. And so my name is Bobette Brackett. I'm from San Francisco. And um, my question mainly is about um, towards marketing and outreach to diverse communities, and I know that typically um, a lot of the PUCs don't do targeted marketing to different specific communities, it's more general, and I just want to know, as you guys move forward, and a lot of these initiatives that you're trying to put forth, as you know, there is a culture competency piece in the marketing piece to get right. people on board right. to the workforce development, to these training programs and so forth, and is there going to be funding that you guys are working towards getting that piece or that component in place as well? Uh, Deidre Freeman of the Durham City Council, and I want to build onto that question based on some work we're doing in the One Water Alliance, and my concerns being the lack of cultural sensitivity and trying to build out economic development programs from, I guess, from an environmental standpoint into the neighborhood is a real concern, but that's separate. I wanted to ask specifically about stormwater and your um, best resources for how to uh, redefine what those stormwater um, requirements look like. We have opportunities to re redefine them in North Carolina around Jordan Lake, and we've had very expensive um, reclamation and projects and programs all put in place that have not reduced the uh, nutrient levels in the, the lake enough for us to qualify. Like anyway, we just. We're just in a vicious cycle of spending money to do nothing, and it's really driving me insane. But um, if you have any resources, that would be great. And what we'll do, thank you for those questions. If, if we can have each of you respond, and that's how we'll, we'll close out. Uh, thank you. Um, so just to kind of go down and say that the, the second uh, question, I actually wanted clarity on, so, because you were talking a little bit fast, so I didn't catch all of it. But um, the the first point about the tactics, you know, we 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 think so hard about how we're going to get the messages out, and we we have the opportunity to do those suffers, um, and so we will look at how we include more of that information in our bill suffers 
we do other direct communication, websites, working with various entities to get that messaging out, and I think we're working on those tactics now as part of our strategies. As far as um, how tech companies can support, we, um, it, we have a smart utility uh, push Digital transformation is one of our strategic priorities, so we're open to partnerships. We've developed uh, a framework, framework for that as well, where we're looking at um, kind of open sharing. We're open to folks coming in and telling us uh, how they could partner with us to, to innovate, to make our operations more effective and more efficient. Uh, to the gentleman that was asking about his technology earlier and how he could get funding, I would say more and more utilities like DC Water are looking to develop partnerships with folks that are developing technologies because there could be a potential for uh, sharing, information sharing, and us providing funding to develop technologies that will help with our treatment processes or making our operations more efficient. Uh, the stormwater piece, I would say, um, you know, stormwater is a challenge across the board for everybody. Um, what we're doing in Atlanta is utilizing more green infrastructure. But what we're finding is, uh, and, and those solutions are, are helping, we're scaling those things up and it's helping to drive economic development. What communities are concerned about is displacement as a result of the work that we're doing. Um, and so we, we did some, um, some special things in the city of Atlanta, working with our economic development folks and Invest Atlanta and other private philanthropic groups to make sure that they put some measures in place that would um, curb the, dis the uh, displacement by paying property taxes, the, the increase in property taxes that offset for a certain period of time and also helping folks to invest in their in their homes and their properties to uh, make improvements. Uh, so I think there's a number of things that can be done. There's no quick answers to those questions. The one thing I would say is <clears throat> I agree that uh, there's more that we can do, uh, particularly as we get more into electronic billing uh, and notices out to our customers to raise awareness. Uh, we are taking a concerted effort to get into the school system uh, at a younger age. In Louisville, we've developed a river-to-river -river education program. So what that does is it educates, uh, you know, third graders, sixth graders, uh, what happens uh, from the point water is drawn from the river, it's taken through treatment, it's taken to the distribution system, it's flushed back into the system, it goes back to the treatment plant, and then back into the river. So it's it's a real comprehensive education program that we've rolled out in Louisville called River to River, and that's what we're working with the public school system to, to get that into uh, third graders and also sixth graders. Uh, the use of social media obviously is something that uh, is a good way for us to get the word out. Um, and now with our job link program, we're really promoting that a lot over social media. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunities there. Uh, as far as uh, technology, uh, there is a group called the Technology Advisory Group, it's called the TAG Group, and quarterly, uh, the TAG Group does, particularly in the Midwest, in the Ohio River Basin and the Mississippi River Basin, uh, they host these uh, meetings with utilities uh, where uh, startups and technology groups can come and present their technologies or their uh, artificial intelligence sensors, whatever, uh, to the utilities so that we can vet them and see if this is something that we as an industry want to pursue or help fund to bring to market. Um, and then the question about the stormwater, the one thing I would add obviously is, uh, as I said earlier, regulators like to go after those folks that have the publicly owned treatment works or the permits. Uh, where I think we need to be focused on what I call source control, going to the sources of those things that are causing uh, us to not meet our stormwater permits. Uh, and then EPA is also pushing something called integrated watershed planning, where with combined sewer overflows and with the stormwater 
and also with other things that are impacting our communities from a regulatory perspective, we should be working together to figure out what are the priorities for our community and for the watershed and really work with EPA to see which one is most important. We can't do it all. We cannot do stormwater, drinking water, wastewater on the backs of local rate payers. And so what are the priorities for uh, the regulators and then how do we do that in an integrated uh, approach? Uh, I'll start with some of the, uh, tie the two questions about outreach together. Um, you know, both Keisha and Tony focused on how they're working with the schools and with technical colleges to help uh, bring students into the workplace. And, and that's the thing that, that you both say as, as a, a second nature, but I think for a lot of industry and for a lot of employers, that's, that's a hard thing to do. It, it takes your time, it takes your time away from running the utility, it takes your time. And that, that the amount of energy and effort that goes into those partnerships shouldn't be underestimated. Um, and and the, the work that you all are doing is, is important in helping to expand that. And uh, I, I mentioned earlier that there's a new career and technical education bill that just passed, and for the first time that, um, that, that bill included allowing states to direct money, states and local areas that are using that fund to direct money towards how are they making it easier for industry to work with schools in that way, both for, for kids and for at the, the community and technical college level. And so I think being involved um, in the planning process that goes into where workforce and education funding is spent is really time consuming, it's difficult to do, but we're seeing an evolution in federal policy and gearing towards how are we making those, those partnerships easier. Um, uh, on the infrastructure side, specifically Keisha mentioned the, the bill that um, uh, Booker and Senator Capito introduced that, um, that would support uh, the water workforce and, and grants there. And one of the things that that could be used for, and I will mention another bill on infrastructure more broadly called the BUILDS Act. Um, and the BUILDS Act would focus uh, similarly on how are we supporting partnerships between uh, industry uh, training providers, other stakeholders in the industry. Um, and also how are we actually spending money to make sure that that cultural competency is happening. So how are we creating the kind of outreach and marketing? How are we bringing in groups that represent communities of color and reach out to communities of color? How are we making sure, and so for my gender equity uh, organization, one of the things we used to say is, if you've got a white man on a flyer, it's really difficult for someone who doesn't look like that to identify their role in that industry. That's what's already in their head. Um, and that's something that at the local level, there's groups in almost every community doing and helping to create that kind of material, but it takes intentionality and it takes more effort and outreach to bring those groups into conversations that are happening. And that's something that um, that, we're, that we're seeing being embedded now, more support for that kind of activity, that partnership, that outreach um, in some some federal bills. And that's, um, you know, something that is recognized the importance of it, yeah. I'll be really brief. <laughs> it's hard to be last. Uh, so to really echo what, what everyone else has said, I would just, emphasize too, beyond what utilities are doing, remember that pie of utilities being one of many employers here, that all types of employers need to be engaged in these sort of tactics, right? Utilities have a lot on their shoulders at the moment. They're already, I mean, t are doing some amazing work. San Francisco is doing amazing work, it's not here today, but, but I would encourage that there are very various employers, various educators on their groups that need to be doing these sort of tactical um, uh, decisions. Um, in terms of the sort of tech sector, one thing that I wasn't mentioned earlier, but I think it's important to, to sort of emphasize is sort of the, the succession planning for sort of the continued career growth for workers in this space. And, and so I know at a federal level, there's even at the local level, sort of utilities, they're looking at competency models and trying to look at the changing company, sort of the changing sort of moving target that workers have to fill uh, over time in terms of actually the newer technologies that we're seeing in their jobs. Uh, and the stormwater bit, I'll just say that <laughs> As I, as I think about this, it's, it's not simply sort of the environmental, sort of regulatory side of equity infrastructure makes sense, but actually there's a good economic financial case for it too. If you make <laughs> these types of improvements over time, you're gonna save money rather than going to FEMA <laughs> and having to have a huge bill. So trying to make that case, I think at a local level that, hey, if we do this now, we're gonna save money in the long term, that's also very small. And thank you so much. I mean, this is a once in a generation opportunity right now because of the time and the moment we're in where we have this uh, sort of the baby boomers leaving and new folks coming in. So I hope that you all have learned something today and can also network with each other. Um, thank you for joining us. It's critical that we have a workforce that can build uh, and operate on our infrastructure. So
So uh, with that being said, I hope you all realize how much of a catalyst the water sector is and can be for a water uh, creation. Let's give our, our distinguished panel a round of applause. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. Let's give it up for the moderator.